Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Robert Geertsema will defend the academic thesis Changing, changing, changing Time, Characterization and Application of Precision Temporal Measurements with Silicon Pixel Detectors. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear friends, family and colleagues, it's an honor to be here today and to be able to guide you through the work that I performed over the past few years as part of my thesis. Uh, chasing Time, Characterization and Application of Temporal uh, precision temporal measurements with silicon pixel detectors. And since many of you might not yet be uh, familiar with uh, silicon pixel detectors, I want to start with a short introduction to them. Um, so, yeah. Um, so these, pic these silicon pixel detectors, uh, the name of them, so silicon means that the silicon is used as a detection material to detect particles. Um, usually they're in the range of uh, millimeters to up to a couple of centimeters and they consist of an array of pixels uh, which is used to measure the position of the particles or the detection. Um, usually they're connected to a so-called ASIC which basically is a small CPU or computer chip uh, which is used for pulse processing. Um, and to give a bit of a more detailed uh, introduction to them I have a cross section. Uh, which you can see uh, up here of uh, the same story. So what you see is again the silicon detection material, which is used for the detection of, uh, of particles. Uh, this is then uh, connected uh, with, in this case, so-called pimpons, so these round balls, uh, to the ASIC or the readout chip. Um, this you can see in this picture on, the, on your left-hand uh, side. Uh, this shiny metal blackish surface is the silicon of the detection material. And this readout chip is then also connected, in this case, with wire bonds to a PCB, which you can also see in this picture uh, by the greenish uh, uh, surface. Um, the wire bonds you might also just be barely to pick out on the left-hand side, these tiny uh, curved uh, wires. Um, and these uh, silicon uh, pixel detectors are used in a wide range of applications. Uh, so uh, you detect them there. Um, ranging from particle physics to quantum optics or uh, more in a biological sense, for example, color tomography or X-ray uh, diffraction measurements or even time of flight measurements, for example, for molecular imaging. Um, since my thesis is mainly focused on particle physics, I will continue uh, to give a bit more detail about this. Um, so one of the, the, the most well-known um, accelerator complexes in the world is CERN. I, I think most of you are uh, hopefully a bit familiar with it. Uh, so uh, what you see here on the left-hand side is a schematic diagram. So CERN and the LHC are located at the border between Switzerland and France, close to uh, Geneva. And below the ground there is a huge complex of uh, beam pipes and accelerators. And what you can see here on the right-hand side is a cross-section of, uh, of the beam pipe, in which you see two smaller pipes, which both contain uh, the proton beams that are accelerated there. So one going counterclockwise and one going clockwise and the dedicated positions, which you can also see uh, underground uh, by the names of the experiments. Uh, these beams are crossed and proton-proton collisions can occur here. Um, since my thesis is focused on one of these detectors, mainly LHCB, um, I want to quickly go a bit more in detail into this uh, specific experiment and detector. Um, so uh, what you see here on the right-hand side is a cross-section of this experiment and detector. And these uh, different colored regions all indicate different uh, sub-detectors of, uh, of this experiment. Uh, and the one that I did the research for during my uh, PhD thesis uh, is the so-called vertex locator, or VELO in short, which you can see in approximately the center of this slide. Um, this VELO is uh, centered around the uh, collision point of the proton-proton collisions. Um, and uh, in reality, so uh, the Velo is located here. Um, in reality, it looks like this. So this was the Velo, or one half of the Velo, right before it was inserted uh, approximately one and a half years ago. Um, so what you can see here are multiple rows of uh, silicon pixel detectors, which you can uh, see by this rectangle with the shiny surface again. And what this detector then measures is uh, if a particle would traverse this detector, uh, you would measure it at different uh, points throughout this detector and you can interpolate the, the trajectory of the particle. Um, so now I want to take a few steps back and again go back to these proton-proton collisions. 
Um, so a proton might be a bit abstract for most people. Uh, so what I always like to do is make it a bit more physical. Uh, so it, uh, and since it happened that just a few weeks, few weeks ago, uh, the YouTube channel Smarter Every Day published a video about colliding bullets. So I thought this is a perfect anal analogy uh, for colliding protons. So what you see happening uh, in this case are two, two bullets uh, approaching each other and then in the end uh, colliding. And with this collision, uh, a lot of uh, different fragments are created and all of these fragments have different uh, positions, rotations, uh, energies. And what we then want to, to measure is uh, all these characteristics. Uh, so for the pr these proton-proton collisions, also uh, different particles emerge uh, with different characteristics. And we want to be able to track these particles, so reconstruct their trajectories. Um, and of course, in reality, for LHCB, this looks a, a bit different. Uh, so this is a so-called event view of uh, a single proton-proton collision for the LHCB experiment. And what you see here on the left-hand side is again uh, where the, the, the collision occurred uh, around the phalo. And what you see coming out are all these different particles that have been tracked throughout this uh, uh, detector. Um, in reality, it's a bit more complicated since uh, going around the LHC are bunches of protons. Uh, so actually uh, groups of protons and these groups of protons collide. So it can also happen that uh, a single collision occurs and the rest just go on uh, uninterrupted. But also multiple proton-proton collisions can happen within one of these bunch uh, collisions. Um, and over the past few years, uh, we increased the amount of protons uh, going around the LHC in order to be able to measure make more collisions and to gather more statistics, which is a good thing for physicists. Um, so back in 2008, when uh, the LHC started, uh, an average of around one collision occurred for the uh, LHCB experiment. And just two years ago, this has been upgraded to around, on average, seven collisions. Um, but the goal is that in 2034, for the next major upgrade, that we will be able to measure 42 collisions uh, during one of these proton-proton uh, bunch uh, crossings. Uh, and as you might already imagine, uh, tracking 42 collisions is quite a, quite a challenge. Um, so this is a simulated uh, event in which you can see 42 individual points, so the proton-proton collisions, and all the trajectories or particles that come out of it. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's quite complicated to, to take now one line and be able to pinpoint it to a, a single uh, point, so one collision. Uh, but luckily, these proton-proton collisions are also a bit spread out over time. So what we can actually do is we can measure the time of these trajectories uh, as well as the collisions. And we can use this information to be able to clean this event a bit more up. Um, so what you see now here is a, a temporal window uh, being smaller over time. <laughs> and what you can see is that the amount of tracks and proton-proton collisions uh, are uh, a lot less. And in this case, for a window of 30 picoseconds, it's manageable to, to easily pinpoint which trajectory. So tracks point to which proton-proton collision. Um, so uh, part of my thesis was uh, investigating what the temporal resolution for the silicon de pixel detector should be in order to uh, go to such a scenario that it's manageable again. And one of the conclusions was that the temporal resolution of these uh, pixel detectors of 50 picoseconds is enough to go back to uh, this scenario. Um, so this also implies quite strict restrictions for the, these pixel detectors, because 50 picoseconds really is a, is, is a small time. So to put it a bit in comparison, uh, light would just travel 15 millimeters in the same time span, which is uh, really short. Um, and to put it a bit more into comparison to the current state of the art detectors, um, currently we're looking at more or less uh, 250 picoseconds uh, resolution for the, the best of the best in full scale applications. Uh, so this also means that we really need to work hard to reach this 50 picoseconds within the next 10 years. And to do this, we have multiple options to characterize uh, these detectors. And um, two of them are, for example, particle beams. So you can use these accelerator complexes also to test these detectors and to see uh, how good and, and where you can improve them, as well as lab systems consisting mainly of laser systems. And from these uh, systems, you then get uh, figures like this one, in which you, as a function of something of the detector, you measure another quantity, and you can see where, for example, an improvement can be applied or where you can uh, correct for some offsets. 
And with this, uh, we hope then that also looking back in time what the, uh, the steps have been throughout time. So going back to 2014, uh, in which the, the temporal resolution of typical sensors was above a nanosecond. Uh, going then now to 2022, in which we have detectors which can reach around 200 picoseconds. That within the, the coming, let's say, eight years, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can reach this 50 picosecond goal that is required uh, uh, for these experiments uh, at CERN. Um, and on that note, I want to return the work to the Prodector. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, before we begin with the opposition, uh, may I introduce myself? My name is Pim Mortens, and I hope to steer this opposition uh, towards a good uh, direction. Uh, I also would like to introduce the promotion team. They won't ask any questions, but they were a very instrumental part of the thesis writing. Um, Professor uh, Merrick, Dr. Akiba, and uh, Dr. Snook. Um, I also would like to welcome all the other members of the um, assessment committee, and a special welcome to Cor Spreeuwerberg. Uh, may I now ask Professor Onderwater from this university, and also chair of the assessment committee, to start the opposition. Dank u wel, meneer de rector. Beste kandidaat, dear candidate, um, as the first one, I'm probably the first one also to uh, congratulate you with this uh, beautiful research described in your thesis. As member of the assessment committee, I took it upon me to read it cover to cover. Um, and, and I have to say I was impressed by the, well, the breadth and the various uh, perspectives that you looked into this, uh, this project, ranging from fundamental understanding of your detector to, well, trying things out. So congratulations on, uh, on that. Now, many, many questions you, of course, already addressed in, uh, in your thesis, um, but there's still a few left, obviously. Uh, and for that, I would really like to go to one of the very fundamentals of physics, uh, and that is something called dimensional analysis. So if you would like to go with me to page number eight. At, at page number eight, you present near the top equation 2.1, where you, well, very uh, uh, succinctly describe the problem that you're trying to deal with, namely particle density in case of, uh, of a high intensity beam. Um, and if I would give this equation to one of my students and explain the dimensionality of what's going on here, I suspect they will be confused. Do you also agree with these students about their confusion? Is there something missing here or is this really what you meant to write down? Um, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the kind words and the question. Um, so I, I think I have to agree with you, but often uh, these equations, we're trying to find a, a quantity which we can use to um, explain or uh, yeah, explain our problem. So uh, in this case, the, the high pileup, as we call it. Um, so often we use these sort of equations which might not technically are correct then in order to, to make a quantity which we can use to compare the different experiments even to each other and to see how these different detectors need to, uh, to cope with these different uh, track densities in this case. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hope that... So, but if, <laughs> if, if I look at this equation and I, I, if I understand the meaning of big R correctly as the distance of a sensor to, to the beam, what you're telling me here or what this equation is telling me here is that I should really move the detector as close to the beam as possible, where R is as small as possible. And that, that is the place where nothing is happening. And if I would move it, say, a meter away, that's where all the tracks are going to be. Is that correct? It should not be correct, I think. <laughs> no, I, 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 at, at, at least to me, it was counterintuitive. Let's not say it's incorrect. I don't know. So... Um it shows the tracks per square centimeter per event. Um, and as you need to say, uh, so, so the track density uh, in this case, so it's the, how do you say this? It's the, it's the amount of tracks or the, the track density at a specific distance. Yeah. Um, so it's not per se for the particles itself, but it's for the detector. Uh, mm -hmm. So if R would be large, uh, in this case, where so you are far away from the, the, the collision point, um, Track density in this case will be uh, 
a bit larger. I think. Well, if you would move from say five millimeters to the beam to five centimeters, you're saying that the track <coughs> density at five centimeters is ten times higher than at five millimeters distance from the beam. Um, That's what this equation is saying. Yes. And naively, I would I would guess that track density scales as one over r squared or something like that. Could it be that you missed a minus two somewhere in a power? Well, it, it's it's tracks per square centimeter. Oh, yeah, so the units are okay. Yeah. The, the dimensionality is what I, or the scaling, if you want, is what I find counterintuitive. So the dimensionality itself is. I oh think yeah, tracks per square centimeter is fine. Eh? That's the, so the thirty-nine. I yeah. assume could be a number of tracks per cubic centimeter. Or something like that. Um, yes. So no, well, so this thirty-nine is is uh, is fitted or mm -hmm. found by somebody in order to, to oh. best match the scenario that the Vela will be facing. Uh, so okay, no. it, that that could be the case. Maybe at some point we we, we can look into this if we uh, well if you can help me out of out of my confusion. I would say it goes as r to the minus two instead of r. But okay, you're the expert, so I'll I'll accept your answer at this time. Um, let's see. Yeah, since we're already at page eight, why don't we move on to page nine because it's nicely nearby. Um, also, during your presentation, you showed the the effect of adding time to uh, well to to the reduction of the complexity of an event, and you nicely showed by turning tracks gray that they would go away and therefore you don't have to take them into account anymore. Um, you also mentioned that, for perspective, that 50 picoseconds is just a centimeter and a half. Your velo was about a meter long, so that's about, what, 300 picoseconds or so, thereabouts, or a thousand picoseconds. So in the analysis that you foresee in the future, are you really planning to use a window and only select hits, say, within 50 picoseconds, and then at some point the particle has had to fly too far in order to be visible? Or do you plan to do a four-dimensional fit or something like that? Uh, so indeed, uh, the, the plan is to, to <coughs> well, sort of use a four-dimensional fit. So, so since we previously, when only spatial information was used, um, we also used the so-called chi-square. So it's the, the distance divided by the, the error of the distance measurement, let's say. Um, but of course, this also goes into combination with the temporal measurement. Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, you can even assign the, the temporal resolution or the temporal error you think the, the measurement has and uh, go the same route as the, the chi-squared for the positional information. So uh, this will be used uh, in, in combination with each other in order to, to extend, let's say, the measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, but for this, you also need to correct for time of flight uh, distances. So since you, you travel a bit, you need to correct for the, the flight time of this. So for each particle, you need to, for each hit, uh, need to know what the distance was to what you think was the collision point and correct for this time offset. Yep. And then you end up with the, 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 yeah, the time measurement of, of the track as well as the, the, the proton-proton collision. Yep. And, and the, so I, I saw you do this on, on the picture and then we used our, our own eyes as the analysis technique yeah, and, and we happen to be extremely good at that. And I know you did not really spend time on this, but perhaps you can speculate. If you change the dimensionality of your data from three to four per hit, can we expect enough progress in compute power and, and analysis techniques to even be able to deal with this? It, it's difficult to say this time. I, I hear a lot of people that are really optimistic about this. Uh, and I'm one of these people that's optimistic about this mm -hmm. because you still have several ways to, to go. You can also say we want to do this uh, time calibration or time measurement uh, even on the FPGA itself, saving on computer power later on during analysis time. Um, so I'm, I'm not yet sure what the final way is that this will go in the end, uh, but I'm, I'm still optimistic that, that maybe a combination of these different techniques will lead to uh, yeah, a, a way that we can even deal with this data. Okay, good. A little bit of time left? A little bit of time, little bit of time left. Okay, then I would like to sort of fast forward to page 61. 
if I'm not mistaken, yeah, where you describe your uh, well, your characterization using the time picks three ASIC. Um, now, in the beginning, you specify that you want to reach a, a time resolution of 50 picoseconds, and then somehow, and now I look at the opposite side of the room, your promoters and co-promoters tricked you into using uh, a clock of 640 megahertz, which, if I do the calculation, uh, gives you a resolution of something like 450 picoseconds or thereabouts. Did they give you a teaspoon to hunt down an elephant? And should you have accepted that? Especially since you are also claiming that new characterization techniques are needed. Um, so uh, when I started the, my PhD, uh, so this was back in 2019, uh, the Time PhD was the only available device that we could really test. Um, so indeed, uh, if you look at this uh, time resolution, you might think it, it's, it's way off, let's say, compared to the 50 picoseconds. Uh, but still, using this chip, it allowed us to, to develop the characterization techniques and even see a hint of what we actually want to see in, on the sensor side, uh, while still preparing, let's say, for the next generation, so TimePix 4 in this case. Um, so indeed, it's not the optimal, but it was what we had at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. So we went with it and developed at least the systems around it and the characterization techniques. And with that, we had a head start for the next generation of chips as well. So there, there then, let me also invite you to speculate, but now slightly more educated, I suspect. My, my quick calculation shows that you would need a clock of something like 8 gigahertz or so. Yeah. So, so this is, is that going to happen? It, it's a bit on the high side. So generally, when the clock is higher, you, you draw more power, and there are power limits to what you can use on, a, let's say, a square centimeter. Um, so even with TimePix 4, 4, so moving from TimePix 3 to TimePix 4, uh, the clock speed was not even increased. Uh, they they well, had, a, had a trick. <laughs> they, they copied the clock a few times, and then you can look at, for each hit, the state of the clock, uh, of the four clocks, and that way you can artificially uh, reduce the size mm -hmm. of these pins. This comes with some other downsides, mainly that, that they're not always as aligned as you would like them to be. Uh, but with these sort of tricks, you can, without going to, let's say, an 8 gigahertz clock, uh, can have a better temporal resolution than you would have with... Uh, so also here you're optimistic that that is going to happen, yes. perhaps. Yeah. Looking at these uh, these developments, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm optimistic that this will uh, happen. Okay, no, yeah. I think that's a beautiful way to uh, conclude this discussion. So give the word back to the, uh, the chair. Thank you, Professor Onderwater. The opposition will be continued with the, by Dr. <coughs> uh, Hintz, a member of the assessment committee and from Oxford University. Thank you very much. So, dear candidate, uh, I'd like to also add my congratulations uh, to the rest of the panels on the, a very beautifully written thesis. Uh, I think there are many areas which were treated in a lot more depth than is typical to see. I think you should be very proud of it. That being said, it would be remiss of me not to have prepared a couple of questions, uh, which I hope you can shed some more light on. So, we'll start at the large side and see how small we can work our way from the, depending on the time that it takes. If we turn to page 162, 163. So, I mean, thinking of the future, and you've managed to build a single chip, and you managed to meet this 50 picoseconds resolution, you now have to build an experiment and a system. And one of the things that you show is that one of the largest contributions to the timing uh, that you need to correct for is the time walk effect. Uh, and how do you see this on a large system level? I mean, presumably this is going to change with radiation, it's going to change with time. How are you going to do these kind of calibrations? Does it need to be done with beam? Is this going to use a lot of precious time? Can you maybe comment a little bit on how you see the operation of such an experiment? Um, dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and the question. Um, so indeed, the time walk effect is quite large, especially at the lower charge side. Um, so this means that you indeed need to correct for this to be able to reach this 50, 50 picosecond, which is the goal. Um, so there are currently quite a few discussions ongoing how to implement this, ranging from again on the FPGA, so doing the calibration beforehand, implementing it in the FPGA and doing it sort of more or less real time in order to, to not deal with the huge amount of data that comes out and then afterwards correcting this. Um, so indeed this needs to be corrected for almost every, every chip, uh, but you can even do this in beam, so during commissioning let's say. Uh, so you can use the data coming out of the, of the, the proton, proton collision for the VELO even 
and uses to, to do the characterization and then implement this in either FPGA or offline. Uh, and that way, hopefully, correct for this time walk effect. Uh, Mm -hmm. And do you imagine it moving even earlier and moving on to the chip side of things? Because, I mean, if you look at the total data which comes out of current experiments, it's terabits per second, and now you talk about orders of magnitude more data. At some point, can you even get the data out to do this correction? And can this be moved from the FPG even further and just done on the chip? Or how do you see this progressing? Um, to be honest, I don't know if it's feasible to do it in such a short amount of time on the, the ASIC uh, in this case. Uh, so easiest would be to do it in FPGA, so close, uh, okay, relatively close to, to the ASIC. Um, but in principle, you can even move it to, to the ASIC if you find some trick, for example, to, to, to uh, even electronically on the analog side maybe correct for this. Uh, looking, for example, at, at uh, old fashioned uh, constant fraction discriminators, uh, where you also mitigate the time walk effect. Uh, but these have always been on the large side, so going to even smaller pixels, this will be quite a strict uh, strict restriction on your uh, available st space on your pixel in order to do it. Uh, so for the FPGA side, I'm, I'm yeah, optimistic, but <laughs> moving even further to the ASIC, I, uh, I doubt in such a short amount of time. Uh, though in the long time, in the long term, it might be feasible or is feasible. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, continuing on this uh, theme, I mean, you also talk about very dense environment, many, many tracks. Are you worried at some point that you have, you know, individual pixels are going to be hit every bunch crossing during the LHC, or are you far enough away in terms of trap densities that, that this is not a worry? Yeah. Uh, so this is a good question. It's one of the discussion points about even where to place the failover currently. Uh, so moving in uh, goes into combination with smaller pixels in order to be uh, able to say for sure that you won't hit the pixel to a certain percent of larger pixels and more space to, for example, implement these, these time or corrections even on chip if it's feasible. Um, so this is always a, yeah, a combination of factors and it's also still an ongoing, ongoing discussion what it will be because also uh, looking at technology side, uh, if you, for example, would go to monolithic detectors, you have smaller pixels and you would be able to, to go closer. Um, but looking at the, the time picks or the velo picks, you're limited in this range because this is still 55 uh, micrometer in pitch. Uh, so this will give you a, a lower limit uh, for this distance or radius. Okay, thank you very much. So that very nicely leads into another question. Uh, so going much earlier, uh, going to page uh, 46, I mean, you show a couple of different, uh, let's say, non-standard sensor layouts. Uh, you talk about LGADs and you talk about 3D detectors. Can you comment a little bit on the differences in fabrication with respect to more standard uh, devices and how easy these are to produce? Um, so one of the main differences, first going to the uh, 3D sensor, is that it's double-sided process. Process. So what you, you have normally, you, uh, you well, remove or implant on one side, and you don't have to do the back side uh, with uh, pixel pitch uh, masks, let's say. Um, but for 3D, you need to flip it and etch away again a pillar and implant. Um, this additional step, of course, costs more money to do, uh, and it's quite tricky to align the two masks going from the back to front side of the silicon wafer. Uh, so that's one of the, the reasons 3D sensors are, are more uh, or cost more than planar sensors. Uh, the algots uh, are also taking additional steps in, to, in order to implant uh, yeah, these gain regions, so they also. Uh, still costs more money <laughs> than planar sensors, to put it uh, bluntly. And do you see more applications of these outside of particle physics, and are these something that industry is also interested in pursuing, or should we ignore that and just pursue them for our own purposes? Uh, you do see the switch a bit. Um, so LGATs, LGATs are also used outside of well, physics. 3D have hopefully will uh, come in the, the coming years, uh, I hope, um, even with going developing these processes, they become cheaper and more available also for, uh, let's say, industry or, or yeah, companies outside of uh, physics. Um, so they are out there, uh, but still this, this cost is for also for other people a limiting factor. Uh, so not the only for research yeah, in this case. Okay. Do I have time for one quick question? Please go ahead. Yep. Um, then just on the previous page, uh, on page 44, 45, so you talk about wanting to make a fast signal, and then you talk about silicon, and you talk about the saturation velocity of the, the charge carriers. And this is an intrinsic property of the material. So are there other materials that could be pursued that have higher saturation velocities or higher critical fields for breakdown? 
uh, and why would you or would you not want to use them? So indeed, there are materials out there that have better, well, in this case, characteristics for the drift of electrons and holes. Um, however, one of the, the main downsides that has been the case for the uh, for the past is that silicon is one of the only materials that really is is available in high purity and is mass produced, so also uh, not too expensive. Um, uh, however, there are other materials such as gallium arsenide, cadmium telluride, uh, diamond, for example, in which these properties are better or different properties worse. Um, so for example, radiation damage, or again, the, the, the purity of the crystal, uh, in most cases is not as good as silicon. Um, so that's why we're still currently looking at silicon. However, uh, again, uh, maybe in the next 10, 15 years, uh, these materials have been, have catched up in this process, have better purity, have uh, better characteristics, and in that way, uh, yeah, they can be implemented, imp could be implemented in the future, and I personally hope so, <laughs> because it's nice to see different materials instead of uh, only silicon in these detectors. And, and is it only the purity that you're worried about in terms of uh, developing these materials? Well, it's the purity and the, the scale of the production, and well, uh, again, the cost, because even if you can produce a really high purity, let's say, diamond, uh, it, it's quite difficult to, to scale them up to, to, to wafer size uh, for these materials. Uh, so then going to larger, so let's say a few square meters of detector, it's, <laughs> it's quite a hassle to, to produce them. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Then I hand back uh, to the chair. Thanks a lot, Dr. Heinz. Um, the opposition will be continued by Professor Heren. He is a member of the Sasso Committee and also of this university. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidates, I also would like to start off with uh, my congratulations to a wonderful booklet and also uh, to your promotion team. The title Chasing Time is something that, of course, my psychology colleagues at uh, the medical center would uh, have a field day with because I think that's what all our research is, uh, is about, So, and as we age as well. Um, I would like to start our discussion um, with a dialogue on proposition number one. And I would like to ask your paronyms, one of your paronyms, to read out proposition number one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, there is no sensor technique that performs perfectly under all conditions. All techniques sacrifice on at least something, such as radiation hardness, spatial or temporary resolution, or signal height. Thank you very much, and my apologies for putting you on the spot there. <laughs> uh, uh, and also for spotting the typo, because you corrected it on the fly, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> um, I'm missing a crucial element in this proposition, and, and that is, at least in my mind, key to its validity. And perfect performance very much depends on the usage of a device. So I would first like to challenge you with what you define as perfect performance, because I could not grasp by just reading the proposition what, what exactly you were looking for. So maybe you could enlighten me with a definition. Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, so indeed, uh, my thesis is, uh, is aimed at particle physics, or in this case, LHC, and more specifically than LHCB or the VELA. Um, so going to the the perfect detector is for me the perfect detector for particle physics or the current LHC, let's say. Uh, so this has some restrictions such as the radiation damage, the pixel pitch, the, the, the everything which is <laughs> in the thesis. Um, so it has been, or the proposition has been written in, in view of this thesis and, and that, that's my, my view of the perfect. Uh, Do you think perfection in that light is ever achievable? It's not. That's, okay. That's the so, so okay. Then we then we agree because otherwise I would have challenged you with your proposition number eight, where you say you're always looking to new uh, new horizons. So, um, that 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 I think we agree on that. But that also merits the question: Can you think of applications of the current sensor technology that is good enough rather than perfect? Uh, so indeed, there are many of them out there. Um, even a few that I showed in the beginning of my my presentation among others for uh, molecu molecular imaging, uh, which you know a lot about. <laughs> um, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, even if we don't reach this goal of 50 picosecond, a lot of applications uh, indeed can benefit uh, 
by this, uh, but this is also what we've seen with even previous generations of the Timepix family. Uh, so one of the the, the main um, uh, yeah uh, one of the main well uh, companies that, that that buy the Timepix, uh, I think one it is is for X-ray diffraction measurements. So mm -hmm. here they're aimed even at, at just spatial position, uh, but here you can see that that indeed there is something in industry out there which can really benefit with the developments that have been ongoing in particle physics. And this is part of the, this continuous cycle of development within research, and then it's sort of blooming out or blossoming out uh, towards, uh, well. Uh, that, that's a perfect segue <laughs> into my, so thank you, that's the perfect segue into my next question, because I think we agree that the statement of perfection and usability and good enough really depends on context. Right? I mean, that's, you will name a few applications. Um, in that light, um, I also want to draw your attention to your impact paragraph. Um, I was actually a little surprised to find that impact paragraph fairly briefly and very strongly with a focus on scientific impact. For me, when I discuss the impact of a PhD student's research and, and their defense in that, it's also about, well, what do these findings mean for society and is there any economic impact and by touching on some applications in your impact paragraph like molecular imaging thank you for acknowledgement beautiful picture that you showed there uh, as well as uh, the pet scanners i wonder if you could elaborate a little bit beyond the scientific impact what this type of research and your results particularly mean outside of science um so it's always nice. I always like to tell people that are not in high energy physics about the impact of these detectors. Um, unfortunately, this often is quite a, a long time span, so let's say 10 years. Um, and not even then. So, so uh, looking at TimePix collaboration, we also have uh, a Medipix chip that is developed along it with the knowledge of, uh, of the ASICS designers. Uh, and what you then, for example, see is that within medical imaging, for example, uh, a lot of these detectors get a lot of attention because they're a solution for a problem that has been out there for them um, and could improve the, well, the quality of, for example, treatments uh, by a substantial mm -hmm. amount. Uh, however, there's always a bit of lack, I find, between physicists and the, the, the rest of the world, <laughs> let's say. Um, but still, you see that, let's say, within a time span of 10 years after something coming out, uh, companies uh, pick it up and make it a product and then sell this to, to more industry and even, uh, in this case, then the medical uh, institutes mm. or hospitals. Uh, so, so the medical institutions, indeed, that, that's a societal impact that I was referring to. And I think that's where also the um, more accurate time measurements will have a big role. But the time picks or Medipix detection family is already, what is it, 30 years old or 35 years uh, meanwhile? So I'm assuming that there was already a thriving economic market on there. Um, and I know of a few, com could you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so indeed, um, this is mainly, uh, at least uh, the applications I know are mainly focused on, on let's say, uh, TimePix 1 in a commercial sense, such as the X-ray diffraction measurements that I, I, I mentioned, that might not be direct societal impact, but at least for industry, uh, it's nice to have. Um, what you now also see coming up is from the MediPix side, uh, well, color tomography, uh, for example, but this still relies on quite, well, new techniques from uh, the Medipix family of chips. So you do see this emerging, uh, but then you also see that getting this approved in a medical sense takes a long time before it's approved. So this even elongates this time span of 10 years. Um, so it might be, or at least I'm hopeful that, that then coming 10 years, for example, uh, these applications get approved. And, and well, uh, in this case, uh, society can can reap the benefits of this uh, in a medical sense. It's interesting that uh, many scientists I speak to always have this time scale of 10 years uh, after they're done with the technology that something will be uh, f uh, fruitful to science and society. I would argue it's already happening because I think there's a thriving market on both the technology as well as the application. But uh, let's uh, stop the discussion. And if Mr. Prorector allows me one more, let's say, more technological question, please do so. Thank you very much. I want to take you to chapter seven, where you discuss two photon absorption. And uh, as I was reading this chapter and I was looking at figure two and the associated equations, I got a little bit confused, but maybe that was my, my uh, limited mind of uh, how to read the, the equation. 
Um, but you talk about the voxel that you generate, the two photon absorption volume, let's say. You describe that in relationship to pulse energy, which, if I'm not mistaken, is the number of photons. I would have expected that you would have described it as a function of peak power, which is the photon density. And um, the number of photons over a certain area, you know, can have many different, particularly non-linear linear temporal effects on the, uh, let's say, response of that two-photon absorption. So I'm curious if you could shed some light or of whether or not pulse energy or peak power is the right term to use and to base your analysis on. Um, so the peak power is, is um, you could argue it can be a, a correct way to, to describe it. Uh, mm -hmm. However, this does assume a Gaussian pulse because then you speak only of the, the peak and the rest is uh, mm -hmm. uh, derived from that. Um, since in this case uh, we want to look at the whole Gaussian distribution, speaking of peak power is not the best way, but just at the energy or the energy density as a function of position uh, and then integrated in this case over over. Uh, time, because we want to know the amount of electrons uh, that have been excited in a, in a volume, oh. let's say. Um, I think this, this answers your question. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but in that light, in figure 8 on page 154, where you start to discuss, uh, let's say, the, uh, the location or the image of uh, this two the scanning of the, uh, the laser, I assume, over a single pixel of the time pix. Mm -hmm. Now, the single pixel is buried underneath the bump bonded uh, uh, silicon slab. Uh, so when I looked at that figure and you talked about the different depth, I, I got confused for exactly a little bit that, that reasoning. Because if I look at the equation, um, depth probably is related to wavelength or focus position. Can you elaborate how you measured the depth, how you determined where you had the excitation? Um, so one of the nice things of, of characterizing detector is that you can also use the detector to, to image your optics in this case. Um, so one of the things, or, or the thing where you can align it in, in height, uh, as we call it, is where um, it enters the silicon. So we have the, the silicon detection volume and below it is the ASIC. So the, the laser is coming from top. Mm -hmm. um, so when it enters the, the silicon, you get an error function. Uh, and this error function is used to determine uh, the mean of the error function, and this is then defined as the well the, the start of the effective volume of the silicon detector. Okay, um, but how do you vary that height then? Yeah. Um, so the laser, unfortunately, is fixed because mm -hmm. you go through an ob objective, and moving this, you you change the alignment of it. So exactly. Yeah. Uh, but the nice thing is that you can move the, the silicon detector up and down, or even okay. left to right. So it's Z focusing that you do with a fixed uh, objective. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then I'm even more curious because I would have expected that if you uh, focus the laser at different depth, that your image would stay the same, yet you see some form of diffusion that I do not understand. Um, so there's diffusion on the sides, which I, I yeah. think is where you're aiming at? Or? I'm also diffusion to the side, but also that the, the center pixel, because I think the pixel that you see is not actually the time pix pixel, but an area slightly larger, but yet on the edges there you measure something going dark, yeah. where does that come from? Um, so indeed, um, so when you, let's say, um, uh, you create electrons on the, the top side of the sensor, they still need to drift down. And this drift is uh, due to the electric field, um, well, you, you push them down basically, but they still have lateral drift. So the further you're away from collecting them, the more time they have to laterally spread as well. And this is what you see happening. So when you're really far away from this implant or the collection implant, they have time to spread out, so this also means your pixel effectively, you see more of the site, though the mean stays the same. Uh, okay. Because that, yeah, <laughs> that's the definition of the pixel. That clarifies a lot, and I think given time, I'll give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Heren. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Hu, a member of the assessment committee and of uh, Robber University, Nijmegen. Dear candidate, I would like to congratulate again for this beautiful thesis. It's really nice that it's uh, brushed everywhere from a simulation to really in-depth uh, detector R&D uh, for this uh, timing uh, sensor technology. So since uh, you did actually start with the simulation, I would like to uh, go to the page 22. Um, 
you, it's very nice that you explain here the impact of the acceptance of the bill, especially taking into account of the temporal measurement. So I'm curious that, uh, does it also study it with uh, other impact on geometry uh, design of the velo in this case, taking into account of the temporal measurement? Uh, dear esteemed opponent, thank you very much for the kind words and the question. Uh, so indeed, it's, it's a bit of the, the chicken in the egg problem because you, you, you need to fix something in order to look at something else. So in this case, we, we decided to, to uh, fix in some cases the, the geometry, or actually in all cases, so the geometry is the same, so the spacing of the modules. Um, however, what we try to, to simulate is the radius of the, the sensor, so effectively changing a bit of the acceptance uh, while keeping the rest the same. Uh, and then you, you see s slight differences and you hope that uh, then by doing a full simulation, so really changing, so implementing different modules and really effectively in simulation changing this radius instead of doing a cut in this case, uh, you see the same results. Uh, however, these simulations take a long time and unfortunately therefore were also not part of my, my PhD thesis. Uh, um. Then could you please try to speculate in this case, if taking into account of the temporal measurements, uh, could you be able to cut some layers or change the distance of the, of, the, of the layers in this case? Would that gain something because of adding the temporal measurements? Do you aim at physical properties that are measured or something more generic? So the final performance that you're aiming at, for yeah. example, as you mentioned of the, uh, the aim of the velo detector. Yeah. Uh, it's quite difficult going to the VELO to, to have a, a generic aim because if you ask different subgroups within LHB even, uh, their optimum is even different, as we also touched up before. <laughs> that really depends on the person that, that you ask and the research that they're doing what, what the perfect detector is. Um, but what you do see is that you, um, for example, want to, to measure closer to the interaction point um, going to the temporal resolution and improving this a lot, it allows you to move even closer uh, because you, you have less overlapping measurements, let's say. Um, however, giving a, a single answer to, <laughs> to this question is, is quite difficult because it really depends on, on the analysis, even uh, uh, how, how the impact uh, is. Of then I would like to go back to the page 10, since you just mentioned about the geometry of it, it getting closer and of the, the beam. Um, so here you mentioned about the four hits as the minimum uh, requirement here as a, as a default scenario. I'm wondering how did you conclude for the four hits and what would it impact if I vary it to three or five? Um, so this four hit minimum comes from the, the current analysis in the data. Uh, which also takes the four hit as a minimum requirement. What we did for the simulations is we took what is currently, let's say, the norm and just applied it in this uh, the simulation and, and see the change, so only the change of adding temporal information to, to these measurements and, and seeing what changes. Um, so you can even argue that going to five might improve, but then uh, in some cases if you uh, if you, for example, have, a, have quite a large angle compared to the beam line, then you start losing this, these hits. Uh, so this is, again, a function of the optimal geometry as a function of the amount of hits that you want to, to have. Um, though, of course, two is the minimum to get a trajectory, uh, but you want to have, for example, a third because this, uh, in view of multiple scattering, for example, uh, it allows you get, to get a better uh, trajectory out of it. Thank you. And then on the same page, uh, if we notice that you have a drawing of the of the detector actually is in rectangle, uh, actually is eventually is a square roughly. I'm curious, would it be better to have a round sensor instead of a square sensor with a radical pixels probably? If, uh, if ASIC allow you, okay. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so um, honestly, I, I don't know the answer to what it would be if it's round. Um, this again is this, this convolution of, of optimizing the whole geometry of the, of the detector. Um, because uh, even if you, for example, would make them smaller and you add an additional layer which is a bit more out, you essentially enlarge again your uh, acceptance. Um, however, what you do see is that there are different uh, pixel well, designs or shapes which allow for a better uh, spatial resolution. So this might actually be a good thing to implement. Uh, though tiling this in some cases, or in most cases, is quite difficult to do. 
and historically we've always stuck to the, the square pixels uh, in this field. Uh, but it would be nice to see different, uh, well, they're out there, but uh, applied in, uh, uh, directly in detectors. I, I personally would find it nice to see a diff uh, finally something else. So. Right. Um, then I would like to even go back to page, I think, page two. There you described very nicely about the scenario that your detector is going to be placed, that is the HC. You mentioned about the closed spaced bunches. So uh, we all know now actually it's chosen to be 25 nanosecond. Could you please elaborate a little bit? Uh, why did we choose it and what kind of impact it will be to your detector uh, requirements? Yeah. Um, so the 25 nanoseconds has historically been the spacing within LHC and going to the high luminosity LHC, um, they didn't change or, or make these uh, the spacing smaller. Um, or c could we make it actually larger? We because, we because we increase the luminosity. Yeah, uh, so you could make it larger, but then you lose again a bit in statistics. Uh, so I, I'm not 100% sure how this discussion goes. However, from the hardware side, so detectors, I, I can say that um, you need to change a lot within the detectors if you want to go to a smaller spacing. So one of the, the, the main things is time walk, for example. So um, delay uh, hits can be delayed or artificially delayed by the time it takes to cross the threshold up to 25 to 50 nanoseconds. So if you would uh, decrease the spacing of these bunches, um, you get more hits that will be detected in the event after and thus cannot be reconstructed and you start missing hits in the event you do want to reconstruct. So you essentially lose uh, performance. Uh. Right. And w actually under the content of all this thesis is on, uh, it's about the hadron uh, colliders, but we also know that there are also uh, lepton colliders running, uh, still running now uh, in the world, but also there are also proposed detector uh, colliders in the future that can be either lepton or hadron. And especially these new techniques, uh, this time temporal measurement is really interesting, uh, driven, let's say, uh, techniques for detectors in the future. What about, uh, what, what does it change actually, uh, the requirements for your, for example, a temporal sensor, a silicon sensor, uh, R&D for a lepton uh, collider? Yeah. Um, so, so one of the main things is that you should take into account what the, the distance is before you stop a particle. Um, so going, for example, to, to current uh, electron accelerators, it's quite difficult to put the detectors in that we currently have for the LHC since the, the energies are higher and the, the stopping power is, is different. Um, so you do need to take this into account and choose your technology. Uh, so in this case, for example, monolithic will be better since it's thinner and you would lose less of the total energy of these particles. Um, however, uh, the characterization techniques and developments are similar in a, in a sense. Is monolithic uh, good uh, in this case for a lepton collider? Um, okay, it de depends what you want to measure. Uh, so if, if you still want to reconstruct... Uh, so uh, what are the... Can you please try to speculate what are the pro and the con in this scenario? For a, a lepton collider? Yeah, exactly. I have to admit this is not my speciality and also not my background, so it's really... I can speculate, <laughs> but I don't know to what extent the answers are, are really correct. Um, but what I would say is that um, it's uh, you need to move in a, a bit closer, I think, um, as well as having less material in order to still measure the particles. Uh, but again, uh, it's not my speciality uh, <laughs> and also not my background. So. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Wu. The opposition will be continued by Professor Hild, a member of the assessment committee at Rutgers University. Yeah, dear candidate, thanks very much for this very nice thesis. Uh, as an experimentalist, I'm very much impressed uh, and, and I love to see all of the technical details and all of the measurements, so really nice work. Um, I would like to zoom in again, uh, as Ron did, on the two-photon absorption a little bit. 
Um, and maybe start with a with a, um, a physics question here. You at the beginning on page 141, you uh, allude to this difference of the light absorption process taking nanoseconds, while the charged particles uh, uh, are more on the picosecond. So what's the diff why, why is there a difference? Maybe you can explain a bit. Yeah. Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the kind words and, and your question. Um, so the the difference here mainly stems from the use of of uh, specific lasers that we used. Um, so since these particles that we mentioned are, are really close to the speed of light uh, in this case, um, the, the time it takes to travel through the sensor and to deposit all the electron hole pairs is almost instant. Uh, well, if you would go to, to lasers in this case, um, let's say a, a nanosecond rise time and a pulse width of five nanoseconds or so, you're looking at, at almost a factor of 100, if I do quickly the math, um, more time it takes to fully um, create all the electron hole pairs. Uh, so th th that's the main difference. So it's more the, the, the laser applied compared to almost instantaneous, instantaneous deposition of, of charged particles in this case. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe another question on figure eight. We were already at figure, figure eight, so it's a very interesting one. Um, and I was struck by this uh, vertical stripe uh, pattern that you say you get from the vertical scans. And I was just wondering whether you can uh, elaborate a little bit on the fact whether the, the kind of the difference in the height of the stripes uh, matches your expectations and uh, w f yeah, what, what you assume before you have done the experiment. Yeah. Um, so be, to be perfectly honest, um, I would have liked to see it flat. Uh, because this is what you expect. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the, the laser system th that we had, this specific one, um, the stability over time, uh, so the, the pulse width in this case, which um, to the power of four influences the amount of electron hole pairs that are generated, uh, since that's power squared um, or intensity squared, uh, a small fluctuation in this temporal width of the pulse will also mean that if it's larger, you will create less, uh, less electron hole pairs. And since the laser fluctuates over time in this pulse width and you start scanning it, you essentially create these vertical lines. Uh, and we try to correct this by, by putting a, a second, uh, well, second photo diode in and trying to correct for it. But unfortunately, we were never able to, to really pinpoint this, this final di uh, difference. So we improved it a lot by implementing such a reference method, but still not 100%. And we're unsure what the remaining, I think, 1.6% deviation uh, still comes from. But if I look at the color, then I think we're just taking these yellow versus the red stripes, and we're talking here about, okay, I don't know whether it's a linear relation, but it's something like the, the dot is something like 100, 220 or so. So does it mean it's a nonlinear relation that it doesn't relate to this 1.6% and it's more like 20%? So it also depends on the time range you, you take. Since this laser fluctuates over, I think there's even a figure in. Uh, let me try to quickly find it. I think it's in the be beginning of the paper. So figure three on the right hand side, uh, you essentially see the, 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 the width of the laser pulse as a function of time, in this case up to uh, four hours. Um, and this also means that depending on when you start a measurement, how long you take per, per pixel or per point, uh, the structure also changes. Um, so, in I think even the same page, you see how we or how it looks after applying the correction. Yep. And for that data set specifically, uh, by heart, I thought it was 1.6 percent, but it can even be a bit more. Um, let me see if I can quickly find it. So it's figure five. Uh, sorry, the two pages I had. Yep. So here you see. Uh, for the, the so-called uh, corrected DOT signal, so after mm -hmm. applying this correction, as well as for the reference signal, as well as the uncorrected signal. And you still see that after applying this correction, there is a certain, unfortunately, uh, structure in there. Okay, very good. Then let me quickly jump, if I may, um, to figure nine of this paper, so it's on page 156. And um, I was just wondering about the I mean, we see the plateau where the chip is, uh, silicon, and then you have the, 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 the peak, uh, and then you have these tails. And these tails are here something like hundreds of, of micrometers. And how does that compare to, you say, your vortex has a, has a depth of, of the order 10 microns or so. so. So how do these relate? What, what do we see here? Um, 
So maybe also nice to mention is that you see here slightly deviations uh, depending on of the, of the height of the, the sensor or the intensity of the sensor depending on where you are. Um, but these tails are due to the reflection back uh, back into the sensor, ah. and this diffuses. Robert Gertsema, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep part because we're taking off Get the mileage,
Robert Geersema, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you degree of doctor. Professor Merrick is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to take the floor now. Belooft u dat u altijd volgens de beginselen van de wetenschappelijke integriteit te werk zult gaan? Eerlijk, zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk? Ja, dat beloof ik. Krachtens de bevoegdheid ons door de wet toegekend, volgens het besluit van de commissie hier tegenwoordig, verklaar ik hierbij u, Robert Erik Geertsema, tot dokter te bevorderen en alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan volgens de wet en gewoonte zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan overhandig ik u nu de bul door de rector en secretaris en overgeleden van de promotiecommissie ondertekend en met het grootzegel van de Universiteit van Maastricht. APPLAUS Hierbij invite uh, dokter Kazuo Akiba. Dear Dr. Hetzma, dear Robert. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to honor be the, I, I don't know if I'm the first person or the second person to, to, great, to congratulate you with your degree. Of course, my congratulations go to your parents and uh, to, to your partner, Danique, to your parents and uh, all the family members and, uh, and friends here. Uh, it's been a long time since I met you. Then uh, you finally reached the end of your PhD, which is... Uh, I hope just the, the beginning of a brilliant career. We met just a few weeks after I started my job at NICAF in 2018. And uh, uh, you were there just a master's student. Back then, we quickly just started uh, working in a lab and we went together to CERN to take data for a test beam that uh, you, you used for your master thesis. That, that was already a lot of fun back then. Uh, the same detector. We tested in beam, and we also tested together in the laser, with in, in, in the lab with the laser. After a quick trip to, to Amov, to where we learned how to drop acid, <laughs> and uh, how to etch the aluminum away from the detector in a safe way. That was a jump start to your PhD in tiny measurements in silicon detectors, which I was very happy that you accepted to, to start and continue this uh, same time, uh, same kind of research that you were doing already in the masters. And uh, the, the first time in group was also very happy that you start doing that uh, because we were all very impressed with your experimental skills and your analytical abilities. But before we started the PhD, you already taught me a lot. And I, I know that you remember this. For instance, you asked me, so what's our work plan? And I thought, work plan? Uh, we plan to work. <laughs> but you actually helped me to write down this plan. And uh, I think we followed it uh, quite well in these four years. And uh, well, brought you to this nice end. Uh, you also made sure that your PhD, PhD thesis was well in schedule, if not early you saw clearly that we had prepared at least two alternative plans beyond the plan B, uh, and which, of course, was very useful in the end, because in the time of your PhD, we faced together a few, a few minor crises, like a global pandemic, <laughs> and some other crises, like uh, the delayed femtosecond laser that we needed for the, for the thesis. Well, the two issues combined was, were actually worked in, uh, in our favor because later we, you managed to align this laser even better than what was provided by the manufacturer. So congratulations. You, you did help me uh, in teaching students, which I always told you that you're much better than I would ever be. And uh, we, we even built a gas detector together from scratch, if you remember which you, you developed uh, and you made the electronics for it with some chips that Martin had in, in a drawer. 
During the, the time of the thesis, we wrote together four papers, which is just a small sample of all the results that you have in your, in, in your thesis. Right now, uh, you started uh, to work in a, in a new job in industry, which I, I believe is still uh, in R&D. I hope they, they, that they learn how to listen as much as I, I did. And, uh, and I hope that uh, we, we work together in the future again. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Dr. Geertsema, beste Robert. Het is mij een genoegen om je vandaag te mogen feliciteren met je doktersgraad. Om even terug te gaan naar ons eerste contact moest ik heel diep graven in mijn uh, mailbox. Op 9 februari in 2017 schreef je dat je interesse had in een project om je bachelor af te ronden. Het, had pro het project had de titel Simulations slash Quality Test for the Atlas High Luminosity LED Upgrade. Daar heb je nooit aan gewerkt. <laughs> dat was een project dat geadverteerd was door een collega die inmiddels al ergens anders werkte. En je kwam bij mij terecht. Snel in het eerste gesprek gaf je aan dat je eigenlijk iets heel anders wilde. Maar dat kon je nergens vinden en het geadverteerde project kwam nog het meeste in de buurt. Toen ik een beetje doorvroeg uh, wat je dan wel wilde, wist je dat heel precies. En dat zijn we dan samen met Martin Fransen gaan doen. Bij de projecten die daarna kwamen, uh, ging het net zo. Het masterproject met Daniel Heinz en ook je promotieproject uiteindelijk. Je weet vaak wat je wilt. Zorg dat je dat ook uitspreekt. Maar vooral laat je niet stoppen omdat je denkt dat er ergens een regel is waardoor het niet zou kunnen. Je bent de enige persoon die ik ken... Uh, die de regels van de oeren van zowel de bachelor, de master en het promotiereglement uit zijn hoofd kennen. <lacht> Tijdens jouw promotietijd kwam de COVID-pandemie. Uh, onze meetings werden online, voor jou uh, aan de keukentafel, met zijn nu en dan Daniek die in de achtergrond langs liep. En tijdens onze meetings verdwenen en verschenen er muren in je pas gekocht, gekochte huis. Uh, jouw plezier in het leven en je werk leek daar totaal niet onder te lijden. Je optimistische en zonnige karakter waren niet stuk te krijgen. Robert, je staat hier vandaag. Deze ceremonie markeert een einde van je promotietraject, maar daarmee ook een lange periode van scholing en studie. In die periode heb je verwachte, maar ook zeker onverwachte uitdagingen in je leven moeten aangaan. Deze ceremonie markeert, markeert niet alleen een einde, maar ook zeker een nieuw begin van een carrière. Robert, het was me echt een genoegen om met je te werken. En als ik je dan nog een laatste ding mag meegeven, <laughs> na al die jaren. Zorg dat je alert blijft op onverwachte mooie kansen in het leven. Soms komen ze opeens langs en dan mag je best je plan een beetje aanpassen. Of dat nu plan B, C of D is. En blijf alles doen met passie, zoals je laatste stelling in je proefschrift ook accentueert. Nogmaals gefeliciteerd, ook aan Daniek en je ouders. Succes met je nieuwe baan en met je verdere carrière. De heer Dr. Geersema, also on behalf of Maastricht University, congratulations with your obtained degree. Uh, I would like to thank all people, all family, friends, colleagues, uh, members of the opposition, uh, the people that watch this uh, ceremony online, and I hereby close this uh, meeting. Uh, before we adjourn, I would like to just have a, a brief uh, household uh, issue. Uh, the committee, together with the candidate, will take a picture uh, on the stairs, but feel free uh, for most of you to already go to the reception, uh, at the reception area, and the close family would also would like to be on the picture. Just join us uh, at the stairs and we'll follow later. So thanks all for being here and uh, the session is closed. <laughs>